good morning to everyone. It's wonderful to see you all this beautiful, beautiful day. It's good to be here. Woo! Love it, love it. Uh, as it's set up on there, we are encouraging you to wear masks, and I see everyone is, so that's very, very responsible of you. Well played, citizens of Springfield. Uh, we would like to first off say thank you for everyone that brought stuff for Connecting Grounds. We have all kinds of wonderful things for donations, so we are very, very thankful for all of that. This beautiful bouquet was uh, shared by Dwayne Coppler in celebration of his third anniversary with Sharon Wyatt. Thank you, Dwayne. Our first song is one of our favorites. It is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, God is All There Is by Eddie Watkins Jr. Please stand and join us. Thank you, John. If you would please join us in our statement of faith. All together, there is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life. God, the good, omnipotent. Please join us for our second song, which is Yes, I Am, by the incomparable Mr. Daniel Namod. Yes, I am here to love. Yes, I am here to serve. Yes, I am here to be the love of God. Yes, I am here to love. Yes, I am. 
I've never knocked myself out yet, though. <laughs> Good morning. Please join me in our mission statement. Our mission is to encourage and inspire spiritual and personal growth by empowering each other to be authentically all that we came here to be. Please join me as we speak the affirmation for today's daily word. The Christ presence within is my radiant source of good. On a clear day, when a stray cloud passes across the sun, I notice the suddenly diminished light. Then looking up, I see brilliant rays of sunshine surrounding the cloud. Instead of hiding the sun, the cloud helps me see and appreciate the sun's radiance. As the sun lights the earth and is a source of its energy, the Christ, the divine presence within me is my light and the source of everything that I need in order to live brilliantly and joyfully. When like a passing cloud, an obstacle or challenge along my path may seem to dim my Christ light, I respond by looking up, by raising my point of view. I am reassured and strengthened, knowing that the divine radiance is shining as brightly as ever. No cloud can dim the divine light in me. The scripture for today, if you will join me, it's John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And let's repeat the affirmation. The Christ presence within is my radiant source of good. During prayer and meditation, please hold the following in prayer 
for their highest and best expression and experience of life. Ben, Stella, Cindy, Kira, Ollie, Brenda, Kathy, Miriam, Elaine, Mary Lou, Clay, David, Bob, Sue and family, and Janet. Allow the beautiful, peace-filled tones of the prayer bowl center you as we begin to move into our time of prayer and meditation. Let us turn our full attention to the vibrations and the sounds of the prayer bowl. And as they begin to fade away, we go inside to find our God. Embrace the Holy Spirit, the whole Spirit of God, we call the Christ Spirit. It dwells within every one of us, even though we may be unaware. If you feel comfortable, gently close your eyes. Inhale deeply. Exhale fully. Inhale deeply. And exhale fully again. Visualize the parts of your body relaxing from the top of your head face moving down through your neck and shoulders. Follow your visualization down to your chest, through your arms, out through your hands and fingers. Return your attention to your chest and move down through the abdomen, down through your thighs, flowing clear to your toes. Bless and give thanks for every bone, every muscle, every organ, every cell in your body. Take another deep breath. The breath of God, our creator, our source. Inhale, giving thanks for life, health, knowledge, and exhale. If you feel your thoughts are wandering, calmly return your focus to your breath. We surrender to the perfection that we are meant to be. Let go and let God work through us, speak through us, and love through us. Assure yourself that you have always done your very best in every action from your consciousness at that time. For those whose names we spoke, for ourselves, for our families and friends, For all people, we affirm healing, love, peace, harmony, and abundance. Send your love to anyone who comes to mind. We are unity, and we honor and respect all peoples of every lifestyle, spiritual belief, ethnicity, and we accept this honor as it is returned to us with love. We affirm the eradication of COVID and other debilitating viruses. We pray for safety in family gatherings and large groups, for flourishing of all businesses. We choose to be a movement of positive, practical spirituality, to live the unity way of life and engage us in a world that works for all, We maintain this consciousness of prayer and we allow our relaxation and our prayerfulness to remain as we continue into meditation.
Father, Mother God, it's us. Your beloveds. We are one. One with all that is. We thank you for your presence in our lives and in our bodies in all the functions. We give thanks that you created us in your image and likeness. And you, we choose to live up to what we expect of ourselves. It is all about our consciousness and where we are at every moment. As we go into the silence, let us bring to mind all of the things that we are so grateful for. And if anyone in your life comes to mind, bless them and let them go. And we remain in the silence. As our band is coming forward, I want to um, introduce Reverend Pat McClellan, who will be doing our lesson this morning. Uh, she's spoken several times here before, and she and her husband have many, many, many years in the ministry as Unity Ministers. So we'll welcome her after their song. This is called When I Was God. Um, I first heard this at Unity Village, and I thought this was a really cool song. One, two. When I was God, I was a light, I was a void, morning and night. Then I was sky, I was a rain, deep blue ocean, fertile plain. But I could not see me at all. Then I became stars, the sun and the moon. I played the ocean, rhythmic tune. And I was like, I drank the rain. I could feel pleasure. I could feel pain, but I could not see me at all. And then I was man, I knew what I knew. I could make words to talk with you. We talked about good, we talked about bad. Talked about happy, talked about sad, but we could not explain God at all.
then I was me making a life with my box of thoughts the joy and the strife then I heard a voice deep in my heart take a new step make a new start so I face my fears I cried all my tears and killed a few monsters between my ears and I found out Yes, I found I'd imagined it all. So now I am working, trying to wake up, trying to drink your loving cup, trying to see past the illusion, trying to be past the confusion. Life truth is a whisper, born in forever. I listen in silence and try to remember when I was God. When I was God. When I was God. When I was God. Good morning. good morning and good morning out there in TV land yeah thank you thank you much um, interesting John that you just sang a song when I was God uh, one of the things I'm quoting from is what God is like and it is a collection of poems by James Dillick Freeman um, that allude to what God is like but of course I'm not so sure that anybody really knows what God is like. <laughs> so, but I, I want to mention that I think, am I coming through okay? <laughs> that uh, all week long, if you've been watching TV, you've been watching the Olympics perhaps. And there have been heroes all week. I love the stories they tell because some of the people in the Olympics have overcome great adversities to be where they are. Their families have overcome many things to be where they are. Um, there have been many heroes made this week, many gold uh, of the Olympic medallions, and lots and lots of heroes. And if you continue to watch, you will see even more and more of them. So today in the talk, I'm gonna talk mostly about one of my heroes. And this person is one of my heroes for surprising reasons that you probably won't recognize um, or even think about <laughs> because there are so many other ways in which he has become a hero to so many people. But one of the things I want to mention about this person is that he was born in Delaware as Abraham Friedman. And at some point, he chose the name James Dillett Freeman and put that all together. But it wasn't until about the 50s when all of those three names were put in sequence. And that is what we know, most him, know him most by. Exactly how many uh, books he's written, I have no idea. Um, and I could, I could figure that out or check that on Google or uh, through Unity or something, but at the same time, that's only a fraction of his writing, only a fraction of his writing. But let me tell you a little bit more about James Dillett Freeman, my hero. 
this is not the reason he was my hero. He was born left-handed, <laughs> as I am left-handed. But that's not the reason. And Dee is, too. I see her raising her hand. Any, any other lefties in here? Most of the time, they don't change you now, but they tried to change us many times when we were younger, for many of us. But his grandfather, uh, James Dillick Freeman, had a brutal childhood. That's the way John Strickland, one of his best friends, would describe it. A brutal childhood. The family had a difficult breakup when he was around 10 years of age, and he went to live with his grandfather. Now, his grandfather's favorite author was Edgar Allan Poe. Do I need to discuss that any further? His, Edgar Allan Poe is known for his murderous kind of macabre writings, and I think the Raven is one of the ones that is the most uh, famous. But that's who he was around most of the time, and his grandfather changed him from left-handed to right-handed. He wasn't going to have a left-handed boy there in his house, I guess. So, he, so James Dillick Freeman had to become right-handed, and he was around his grandfather and all of that murderous, macabre kind of uh, when he was young. So as a significant part of his life, he began to, as a defense mechanism, write his own poetry. <laughs> and when he wrote poetry... As you know, his poetry was positive poetry. So it was kind of in reaction, maybe, or resistance to his grandfather's state of mind or state of consciousness that he, um, that he wrote poetry. And it was um, wonderful poetry. He is known as the Poet Laureate of Unity. For over 50 years... James Dillip Freeman was the head of Silent Unity for over 50 years. He worked at Unity for over 70 years after he graduated from the University of Missouri. He was introduced to Myrtle Fillmore around that time, and she really was struck by this young man and what he could do. And I think we'll all be struck by, by him by the end of this talk, at least I hope. But as a defense mechanism, he began to write poetry. Later, Merle, Myrtle saw something in him, and he became a printer's devil, later on a printer. He Finally, he was the one and only teacher. This was down the road a little ways. The one and only teacher for the Unity Ministerial School. That was in one definition of a Unity Ministerial School. And then World War II ended. World War II, when World War II ended, the soldiers wanted to utilize their GI Bill to become ministers in unity that knew about unity. So Jim was asked to set up a program of ministerial training for the people that came out of World War II wanting to use their GI Bill to become ministers in unity. And for a long time, folks, I have to tell you, and Jim Freeman would say that if he were here, although he's on the other side now, <laughs> but he, he said unity was a work of women for many, many, many years. Mostly women were in unity. And when the young men came out of World War II and wanted to use their GI Bill, they had no program for them. So they asked Jim to create one. So Jim created the first ministerial program for vets that came out of World War II. And for a while, he couldn't settle on whether it should be a two-year program or a three-year program. But they did a program... <laughs> And the first seven young men that went through on the GI Bill that were ready to graduate had finished that program, whichever it was, a two or a three year at that time. They asked Jim to prepare the benediction for the graduation. Now, he'd been the only teacher for a long time, and he had been um, his teacher, but his conclusion was, 
what do I do? What do I say? This was creating a situation for him that he was uncomfortable with. So he dealt with it a little bit. He didn't feel capable of giving the benediction. But his conclusion was, what does it mean to be a minister? He asked himself that. And he needed to answer that for himself in the writing of this benediction. So he wrote this benediction, and it became a poem. It became a poem, not a poem, but it does, not a rhyming poem, but it became a writing that he had mimeographed, and he had, had, this was a gift to my husband from James Dillett Freeman and whoever framed it for him. I can't remember. Do you remember who it was? Huh? Conrad Stahl, the, the person that introduced us, <laughs> framed this and gave it to Les. But it was written by, handwritten by, James Dillett Freeman and is, is now in this frame. And it is entitled, What Does It Mean to Be a Minister? And I'm going to lay this down over here. What does it mean to be a minister? Now, I want to mention a couple of other things. James Dillett Freeman never served as a minister. He never had a congregation like this. He never was a minister. You, I think he was ordained at some point. But he never served a congregation. He was at Unity Village for 70 years. And uh, I think he was probably there until he passed or still involved there when he passed. But um, every man a minister. So the question came up on me is, how did he know what a minister was? If he never was a pastor or a minister, how close did he get? And as I looked at that and we're going through, there were 12 points. Now, think of the number 12. <laughs> 12 was very important to Jesus. 12 is very important to James Dillett Freeman. And one of the points, the first one is, um, it means to make yourself small so that other people can feel large. Every year in our ministry, we had thank you and celebration kinds of, of, of services and programs for people who volunteered for the church, people who had birthdays oftentimes, people who had been married at, at a, a long time, all kinds of programs for volunteers, graduates, for any event worth celebrating to make these people feel precious and to feel valued and to feel loved and appreciated. It was so important. He knew that. He got that perfectly. Number two says it makes... To, it means to make yourself a servant so that others may feel their mastery. If there's anything that is true about ministry, it's that. You are a servant. You are a servant to other people. I, re, I think I noticed that the most in my ministry when I served at Presbyterian University Hospital as a chaplain during the AIDS crisis in the 70s. Because there were people in the hospital who were of various b religious backgrounds. And the office of the chaplain, which I was um, there at that time, had all of these resources to where if somebody needed uh, a communion, you went to their faith understanding about communion and their faith wordage about communion, and you serve them communion. If they wanted a last rites, you did a last rites. If they wanted something from any faith, and you had it all available to you as a chaplain, you went, you did your research, and you went back and you served the people. Where they were, Jim got that right too. Number three, it means to give so those who lack can receive. The pantry out here takes care of that. Also, the one outside takes care of that. And this congregation has made a commitment to work with the community. I don't know if I'd get the name 
quite right, but to, to work with the community to help the homeless and to help the people who have needs in this community. That's what it means. Third, it means, uh, fourth, it means to love so that those who feel unloved may have someone who never rejects them, someone with whom they can always identify themselves. That is an extremely important part of ministry. How James Dillett Freeman knew this, I have no clue. But he really hit the nail on the head when he said, you have to love so that those who feel unloved will feel that love. And that's the biggest challenge, I think, of, of a minister, is to love everyone and everyone equally. It's very important to do that. Um, it's very important to um, be available to people when they need you. I remember in uh, Wisconsin when we were there in ministry, a lot of times Les would have three counselings already scheduled before he went to the office that day and five might walk in from the street, might walk in from the congregation and one or the other. That's eight hours of counseling, folks. <laughs> it's really important to be available though. And what's interesting is that in our family, the commitment was that we all know where everyone is at all times so we can make all kinds of changes and adjustments that we might need to. Talk about un unintended consequences. To raise a teenager in that kind of a home where they understand that, that mom and dad and everybody is always accountable to everybody and everybody knows where everybody stands makes it awfully easy when they start dating. <laughs> They already understand that's important in life. And we always knew where Melody was when she was dating. It also helped that she dated a boy that had the car and he switched off with his sister to use the car. And his folks told him if he ever was using that car anywhere other than where he was supposed to be, that he would lose and his sister would have loved to have seen him lose the rights to, to the car. <laughs> so that also helped. But it's interesting that counseling is a very important part. And sometimes I have seen him have eight hours of counseling. When we were called and someone went to the hospital or someone needed us in a nursing home, usually we both went. Sometimes he went himself because he was the, the minister at that congregation. But in the last 24 years, we've both gone. And the interesting thing is, whether it's in the hospital or at home or in a nursing home or whatever, that it's very, very important to be there when you're needed. So Jim got all of those right. I think that <laughs> number five says it means to hold out your help so that those who ask and deserve and also those who do not deserve and do not ask are avail that it's, your help is available to them. And that fits with the counseling as well and the visitation. For most of the many years we were in ministry, a ministerial team, we both went and there were times when it was a situation, one, I, once I recall a young man driving to his after school, on a, riding to his after school job on a bike, being run over by a car. <clears throat> and he was in the hospital on machines immediately after that, when, when, the hosp when the ambulance got him there. I don't know how many hours Les was at that hospital, but it was clear through pretty much most of the night until the family was had to make a decision about whether to unhook the uh, machines or not for that young man. He did not make it through that accident, I have to mention to you, but it was a blessing um, that we were there and a blessing that we were there with the family and that those things happen many times. It's interesting that Jim, and one of the reasons he's my hero is because he had a brutal childhood, but he did 
not use it as an excuse. He did not allow it to pull him down. He did not become negative as he could have, and many people was. There's a story about this man who had two sons, and he was, himself was a falling down drunk. And both sons were asked the same question. With having the father you have, why did you turn out this way? The one son had become a drunk, and he said, well, my father was a drunk, what do you expect? The other one became very, very different, became a very spiritual person, um, became a very good person, and his answer was exactly the same. Well, my father was a drunk, what do you expect? It's our choice. It's our choice what we do with our childhoods or our early lives, and that is one of the reasons he's my hero, is that he never rested on those laurels. Now, I also have to mention some of the, the prayers, and number seven means it, keep, it means to keep a cheerful outlook so that those who are easily cast down will have someone to lift them up. I have to say this about James Dillett Freeman. When he smiled, he literally glowed. He literally glowed. And it was interesting to me that his early childhood was brutal, but he also had a wife that he loved dearly that died at an early age from cancer. That it caused him to be very distraught, but he never became down about it. He became distraught. I think he probably looked at Psalms 139, a lot, the first 18 verses, uh, during the time that he was recovering from the loss of his wife because he, um, the poem that came to him, and this was the only poem that I know that he has said that it came to him word for word in total, was I am there. And that he wrote for his wife after she died rather young. Now, he was head of Silent Unity at that time, and there was a woman that worked in Silent Unity by the name of Billy. Billy was married at the time, but when Catherine died, James, James's, um, hus Jim's husband or wife, um, when Catherine died, Billy divorced her husband, set her cap on James, <laughs> on Jim, and she got him. <laughs> so Jim and Billy were an item, were a married couple for many years also. Billy replaced Catherine. And in their marriage, when they became married, he wrote the blessing for a marriage. That was written about he and his wife becoming married. It's interesting that the most inspiring times in his life he wrote the most beautiful prayers. Now, there was one that we have used in many funeral services called The Traveler. Many of you are familiar with that poem, very famous poem. That was written upon the death of a good friend of his. I am there for Catherine. Then this was for a good friend, The Traveler. So his poetry was written at meaningful times in his life as well. I was at number seven, I think. No, number seven was the cheerful outlook. Number eight means to keep faith and to keep on keeping faith even when you find a little reason for keeping faith. Now, I want to mention that all of these positions that he took in this, what it means to be a minister, are things that um, reflect the principles. If you read and study and live these principles, these 12 items are easy. They're easy when you understand the principles and when you live them and when you constantly study them. For many years, for probably 40 or 50 years, the editorial department received all kinds of, and they still do, receive all kinds of photographs from around the world, from photographers around the world. 
they have them in a big room and they select they would select one a month put it on Jim's desk whatever the framing whatever the picture was from wherever in the world it was Jim wrote a poem for many many years the picture was on the front of a daily word the poem was on the back of a daily word the month that Les and I got married it had hollyhocks on the front of the Daily Word, and his poem on the back was Hollyhocks, about the incredible surprise that you have by seeing these flowers crop up because they're kind of wild in different places in the country. And so you might have alongside of a sidewalk, hollyhocks strung up that you weren't expecting. And when Les and I met, it was that kind of a meeting where a mutual friend introduced, oh, Pat, this is Les, Les, this is Pat, and I'll never forget the inflection because it was like, here's the one, here's the one. Um, amazing. Let me go on to number 10. Means it means to be God-centered and human-hearted, to involve yourself in man's humanity, but to keep your vision on man's divinity. You always have to listen to the humanity, but you never give in to the humanity. You always hold up in your mind, in your heart, and then for the people that are experiencing a challenge, what the divinity is in that. It's really important. So number 10, he got that. This man who never was a minister, always was a poet and a teacher, got them all right. 11 says it means to share in the great moments of men's lives, in birth, in sickness, in marriage, in death, and at all times, whether it's crisis or celebration, being a comfort and a blessing, and above all, a sense of presence that sometimes we cannot see and of a meaning that often we overlook. He, he nailed that. He nailed it perfectly. His final point is, this is what it means to be a minister of God and a minister to man. A minister of God and a minister to man. Now, to continue why he is one of my heroes, in this book, What is God Like? My favorite poem is this one, which reflects the two rocket that rockets that went up a, couple, a few weeks ago, up on this flame. I watched the rocket flight. I saw men ride a thundering plume of flame serenely out of sight. They rode astride a million fiery horses yoked in one dancing blaze until they flew free. All of our, free of all our earth crawl and weighty ways, like the wind the ship's wash came, shaking the earth and me. And then I saw the first man rubbing fire sticks until his straw glowed and puffed smoke. I watched how he leaned and blew till the fire broke. And the flame crept, leapt, soared, roared, not only in the straw, but in his eyes. And then I knew that the fire by which men rise and leave old worlds behind leaps not so much in the pale straw or the rocket's tail, but in the mind. Isn't it amazing how he put that together? It is upon this flame, he says, man flies on the mind. The other one that I want to mention, and, and this, this will close us, is that, and there's so much else I could say, to, about Jim. His wife, Billy, did his hair for a long time in sort of a pompadour. She passed away, and as she was dealing with Alzheimer's, she said to him, she said, Jim, please don't put me in an institution. He never did. He kept her at home. She passed away, and it's interesting that 
Les and I weren't around the village much after that time because we don't remember um, much about Billy's passing or after Billy was involved in Silent Unity. But um, he had a third wife. One of the other reasons that he is my hero is that he never let this fact get him down that he had to bury two wives. He went ahead on, but he also says that if a young man wants a wife, he should come to Unity. <laughs> Hang out with the ladies that work at Silent Unity. They're a wonderful bunch of women, and he worked with them for over 50 years. <laughs> and, he's, and that's where all three of his wives came from, was in the Unity movement. Fascinating man. He had a dog, and that dog was a Saluki, one of the very rare breeds. And he called that dog Zag. Zag was so important to him that he never put him in a kennel. He had one of the students, and one of my fellow students would go to Jim's house and stay with Zag every time Jim was on the road traveling. And Jim and Billy were on the road traveling. And he wrote this poem about his dog. He dearly loved his dog, and he dearly loved his wives. Just to be loving, just to be loved, how few of us know that is enough. My dog is very much a dog. She does nothing except what a dog should do, which is largely nothing. She is not even an especially affectionate dog. She does not leap up on us when we come home or cover us with wet kisses. But in a quiet way, like some human beings, she shows us that she loves us. She is a beautiful dog, though not even that in everyone's eyes. But she does none of the things we human beings have come to feel are necessary, that we've become to feel it are necessary. She does not possess a fortune. She does not do useful work. She has no fame. So um, no important position in the community. She shows no exceptional talent. She does no great feats so that we can brag about her to the neighbors. She does not even guard the house do, or do the clever tricks for company. She does only one thing. She lets us love her. And folks, that is what's kept James Dillick Freeman's heart open for so many years. He is at this point deceased, but there's so much more about Jim Freeman. And I really want to stress the fact that he's my hero because he went through so much, but never let it drag him down. He always kept his faith. He always kept his cheerful personality. I think it's kind of humorous that after Billy died, no other woman cut, it, colored, uh, cut his hair. <laughs> and if you've seen more recent pictures of James Dillick Freeman, his hair is down to about here by the time he passed away. So he just let it grow and after Billy died because she was the keeper of a beautiful pompadour that we know uh, James Dillick Freeman by. It was interesting to me also, and I think it's time to go, isn't it? <laughs> it's interesting to me also that he usually doesn't, he might prepare one talk a year, and he might do it several times during the year, but if he came here to talk, he would expect you to ask him questions, and that would be the talk, answering your questions. That's also how ministers give of themselves to be available and to define themselves. Thank you so much. And it is time for our giving and for our prayer, or for our, uh, oh, I want to mention that he, he wrote two poems that went to the moon. The first one he did not know was at the moon for 10 years. Um, James Ir no, um, can't remember the, the, one of the first guys that went to the moon took the poem with them. They each took something and left it on the moon. And, and they took Jim's Freeman, Jim's poem, uh, which you will hear in song form in just a moment. 
um, the second one was by Jim Irwin, and Jim Irwin took I Am There to the moon and left some copies there. But he came and he did a presentation at Unity Village for the Silent Unity people, and he presented Jim with the poem that he took to the moon and back um, as a gift to him. So um, that was one of the things that I think is outstanding about Jim Freeman, one of my heroes. So enjoy the heroes this week, and it is time for our, there are some place where the, there we go, I don't think I can memorize all of those, but we even accept cash <laughs> or check, but the Tithely app and uh, those places up there will help you guide, your, help guide you in giving to this church. This church exists only on the contributions that it receives from the services that it gives. And so I encourage you to give and to join me with, is it back there? Our giving, ready, together. The divine love blesses and, and multiplies all that I, all that I give and all that I receive. And for any gifts that you'd like to give in person, here are our ushers. And as the band comes forward, we will hear song based upon Jim's poem that went to the moon. Actually, that's Prayer the for next, protection. That's actually the next one. <laughs> this is uh, Holy Now by Peter Mayer. Thank <laughs> you.